Hello, and welcome to the Waves webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about EQ, the basics and beyond, presented by Barry Wood, author of the book Waves Plugins Workshop, Mixing by the Bundle. But before we get started, I'm going to take a minute and go through the format of the webinar for anybody that hasn't done one of these before. My name is Yoni, and I'm the moderator. You can't see me, but I'm here working behind the scenes to help make sure everything runs smoothly. The webinar will last about an hour and has two parts to it. The first half will be a presentation from Barry, where he'll walk us through the most common processing techniques used in mixing, beginning with the fundamentals of equalization. The second half of the webinar will be an open Q&A. Feel free to submit any questions you have, and based on how much time there is, we'll try and answer as many of them as we can get to. You can send your questions in at any time, but you won't see them right away in the chat, as they'll first go to me, and then I'll feed them to Barry one at a time. Keep in mind that there are a lot of people online with us today, so we appreciate your patience while you wait to have your questions answered. I'm going to hand things over now to our presenter for today. His book, Waves Plugins Workshop, Mixing by the Bundle, provides an informative overview of the Waves plugins used in mixing studios the world over. Each chapter covers a wide variety of plugins, includes valuable tips and tricks that will enhance your productions, and offers real-world, hands-on experience through downloadable audio files and plugin presets that let you actually hear the power of these tools. Today you're in for a treat as you're going to get an up-close look at the wealth of information presented in this book, starting with the world of EQs. So please welcome the author of Mixing by the Bundle, Barry Wood. Hi, I'm Barry Wood, the author of Waves Plugin Workshop, Mixing by the Bundle. Uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I've been a fresh professional audio engineer for nearly 30 years and started out back in the days of uh, analog tape and non-automated mixing boards. Uh, editing consisted of breaking out razor blades and mix recall was an involved affair that required a substantial amount of uh, time with careful documentation or very good memory. Um, the, to, to say the least, I'm loving the new tools that we have these days. Uh, I've worked as a technical editor on seven different audio books about audio uh, by authors such as Mitch Gallagher and Bobby Owinsky. And the publisher of those books asked me if I was interested in trying my hand at uh, writing a book of my own. And they wanted to do a book about Waves plugins. So the, the concept I came up with uh, was to produce a song for the book and then mix it each chapter using a more complex or a more complete uh, bundle of Waves plugins. And so it really got to explore each, each plugin in, in its application. You know, the first half of each chapter talks about the, um, you know, each plugin. The second half talks about the application to the mix. Uh, for this webinar, I'm going to be using an example project that I put together for the book. And I'm also going to be using some of the illustrations that I created for the, uh, the book as well. Uh, today I'm going to focus on EQ plugins. Uh, since the book and this webinar are going to cover the nuts and bolts aspects of equalization, I'm, I'm going to be skipping all the artist series plugins. Uh, there's some interesting processors there, but since they ab abstract the underlying mechanics of what they're doing, they're not particularly applicable here. Uh, likewise, a one-knot plugins wouldn't make very good learning tools in this context. Um, let's see. This is the uh, the list of uh, this is these are the bundles I covered in the book, and these are the EQ plugins that appear in those bundles. So you can see how how things break down as you go through each bundle. Uh, if you can see the platinum bundle gets a pretty big boost. And what you get, and then Mercury, you obviously get all the fun stuff. Um, Waves kind of has three different classes of plugins, at least the way I look at it. There's uh, the original ones like Renaissance EQ, uh, the Q10, and linear phase plugins. Uh, then there's the model plugins, the, the VEQ, which are, you know, they don't say Neve, but, you know, they're modeling the, you know, classic Neve plugins. Uh, the Puig Tech, which are pull techs, uh, the API, and the Kramer. And then they have a handful of other plugins that are, they work in the, uh, in the, the frequency domain, uh, but they're not really normal plugins. There's a Max Bass, um, and the similar Renaissance Bass, and Low Air. Uh, so I'll be covering all these plugins uh, as I go through this. 
Um, in fact, there's a little clear shot of the uh, of the list of plugins. All right, so let's uh, start with the basics. Um, there are three basic types of plugins, um, or three types of filters. You know, a plugin is made up of a filter, you know, one or more filters. Um, there's high pass, low pass filters, shelving filters, and uh, bell curve filters. So with the, the high pass filter, it's also known as a low cut filter, which is a little more intuitive, but more often than not, you'll see it referred to as a high pass. This is showing a high pass filter, and the blue area here is where the uh, the audio that's being cut. On the other end, you've got the low pass filter or high cut filter, where everything in red here would be cut. Um, the shelving filters, you basically pick a frequency, and everything from that frequency down is affected by the filter, whether it's a boost or a cut. And it can be a, a low shelf or a high shelf filter, boost or cut on either side. And then the other basic type of filter is a bell filter, where it's going to just affect a range of frequencies. Uh, in this case, you see this is a fairly wide cut, and this is a pretty narrow cut. Now, the, the width of the filter is what's referred to as Q, or bandwidth. With a very high Q, it's going to affect a small number of frequencies with a, a low Q it'll affect a wider range of frequencies and you know the application is just going to depend on uh, on what's called for so let's uh, see these things in action so this is a project that I created for the book it um, you know all the all the tracks are downloadable from my site and the publisher site and all the, the presets for all the Waves plugins are also available uh, for download. So, you know, with the book, you can follow right along and see exactly, you'll listen to uh, exactly what, what I'm talking about in the book. Um, so let me play just a little bit of the intro here on its own so you can get an idea of what, what the uh, basic tone of the song sounds like. So here it's a you know basic kind of rock pop tune, uh, and you you see here I've got the uh, the pass analyzer up. Um, that can be useful um, in mixing. Uh, there there's sometimes when there's frequencies, stuff happening in frequencies you can't hear, particularly in the low end, that you can you know become really apparent when you see them here. Uh, and I also thought it might be useful for uh, people who are um, watching this on. Uh, bass challenge speakers say on a laptop because um, some of the uh, some of the examples I'm going to be talking about the uh, you know the specific effects you know the low frequency stuff uh, so I'm, I just I'll leave that up over the course of this so let me bring up uh, on the master fader I've got um, I've got a Q4 which is um, you know waves Actually, the, the the first EQ they ever had, I actually used that back on the Auto Media 2 card a um, long time ago. Um, and it's a basic EQ, but it's, you know, really uh, very useful. So let me uh, start by showing the, just what the sound, you know, you let, let you hear what, uh, here, here's a, a high-pass filter, and I'll just sweep it around a bit. The more I need. So you get the uh, get the idea. It's not terribly useful on an entire mix, but uh, it becomes really apparent what it's doing. Here's here's a uh, low pass filter. Reality. Never. 
So uh, that could be a, you know, sometimes that's a, a fun thing to put on the master fader for effect. Um, let me show you with a uh, Q10, you can choose, you know, each of those basic filter types, high pass, low pass, high shelf, low shelf, band pass, or bell filter. Um, so let me show you the low. So oh, that, that's uh, a useful filter for, you know, shaping. You know, if you just need to make things a little less bassy, you can kind of use a low shelf to uh, pull that down a bit. Uh, here's a high shelf. And um, you can see the, uh, the Q here. On, on this particular plug-in, with the uh, low pass, high pass, and the shelving filters, the Q doesn't have any effect on it. Uh, it's a fixed roll-off. You know, uh, um, usually it's, ex it's expressed as 6 dB per octave, 12 dB per octave, 24. Um, you know, and the 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 shape kind of shows you exactly what's going on. It's going to cut it off. You know, very quickly past that corner point or more gently. Um, now the uh, and pass filter. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me uh, play with that. So you can hear with a with a fairly tight cue you get uh, Kind of a resonant synth kind of sound. If you if we widen that out, it, that becomes less obvious. You know, uh, a, sharp, a high cue, a, a real sharp cut like that is uh, handy if you're trying to get rid of you know, a specific frequency range and try to leave the rest alone. Um, let me show you uh, an actual application of, uh, of this. In the, um, like on this tune, on the, the chorus vocal, I've got some pretty extreme compression and so it's really bringing out everything that was captured on the mic uh, it was um, so it, it's just you know the, the heavy compression is just bringing everything out um, in fact, I'm not talking about compression on this project but I'm doing the all button mode on the CLA compressor which just does some crazy stuff but what happens is you've got um, I'll bypass this, and you can see in Paz, when the vocal's going, there's a whole bunch of rumble down here. Running aground, my sails all in tatters, looking... That's not something that you really hear in the mix, but if you have a bunch of tracks with that going on, you're going to get this buildup of low frequencies down there that just ends up making the mix, you know, kind of muddy, and not as clear as it as it could be. Now, putting a, a high pass filter on that, you can just cut that out and not affect the tonality of the vocal. Around, trying to find the answer. You can see down here. Running aground, my sails all in tatters. All that junk down there is is gone, and you can see this is kind of a sharper um, curve than than what when I was first showing you uh, Q10. What I've done here is I've got two filters, two high pass filters set at the same frequency, and I just stack them up. So that I'll, essentially it's kind of a way of, you know, creating a, a steeper uh, filter, doing one that would allow you to uh, control the, uh, the roll off. And 
you know, so for that, I kind of dial in the frequency. You, you want to have it just below where you can hear it acting on the audio that you want to keep. Um, because you don't want to cut out the low end of the, of the vocal. You just want to cut out, you know, the, the junk that's happening down below there. Um, another really useful part of filters is, um, in a mix is making room for the various, uh, the, you know, the various elements. Um, you know, if you listen, if you EQ each track in a mix, just so each track sounds great, you put it together and you're probably going to have just mush. Um, you know, a lot of these, you know, classic tracks, have you ever seen these, these um, you know, shows where they take it apart, you know, track by track, you listen to some of these and some of these individual tracks kind of sound, you know, like crap. They're just, it's like thin and it's like, it, you know, on its own, it doesn't work, but in the context of the mix, it works great. Um, in this song, I've got, there's a, a breakdown in the, in the middle where it um, goes from live drums into some loops and, you know, some other stuff going on. Uh, let me play that section just leading into it and then leading out of it. Kind of this nice little change up, you know, gives a you know a different feel in the song, um, and then it comes out into kind of a more of a more of a bridge, but you know the drummer is getting on the toms, and I've got three different loops going, uh, two for the entirety of that section, and then one that comes in the second half, um, and to make those work, it took a fair amount of EQ to 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 get those to you know to really work together. Um, let me uh, bypass EQs and I'll just solo these. Here's a uh, one loop. So you got kind of a big boom on one. And here's another one of the other loops. third loop and you can see the bottom end there's just huge kind of distorted sounding low end on that uh, leaving those as is they don't sound too bad altogether without the EQ Yeah, it's not too bad, but one thing I found is that coming out of that section into the next one with the toms, you know, the song, you know, the, the bridge should be building up, and with all that low end going on, when it went into the, the next section, it just kind of laid, just fell flat. So I went through the loops and figured out which one I wanted to have as my, my primary loop. So I, I decided the second one. Was going to be kind of the, the the main meat of that. So the EQ on that is uh, fairly minor. Um, I've got uh, just a little bit at a little bit of boost at 180. Uh, I've got a little bit at uh, 820. Got a little bit of cut at 1.8k, and a little boost at 4.7. Pretty minor. If I play this and bypass it, you know, it won't be real obvious. Um, but the real EQ came in 
with the other tracks um, using uh, the API. I'll go more into uh, more in depth on on these actual EQs um, in a little bit. But for this one, I've got a at 100 hertz. I've got a 9 dB cut, so I'm just pulling out a lot of the bottom end. I'm also um, so you can hear this is uh, with EQ engaged. So by cutting out that bottom end, it made these two loops work better together. And that's part of what the little mid-range cut on the, the main loop was, was to get a little more space for the, uh, the mid-range stuff happening in the other track. Now this third one, I'm using the Renaissance EQ. Um, you can see right here, just slamming, just slicing the bottom end out and giving giving it a real uh, kind of mid-range, upper mid-range boost. So here's with a bypass. And then with it in. Sounds kind of thin on its own, but putting all three together, They work, and you're not getting a huge amount of this bottom end buildup. And it also allows for uh, for an actual lift when the live drums come back in. It actually hits and keeps them moving forward. Um, let me talk about the Ren EQ a little bit. Um, this is uh, this is a great EQ. Um, unlike the um, um, the Q10, the uh, the Q actually does affect these other uh, frequencies. Let me uh, switch over. <laughs> Um, the, um, and actually, let me, let me just put a new instance in here. Okay. So similar to Q10, you've got your, uh, you know, different shapes. Uh, this one's a little bit different. You got um bell you know low shelf high pass and then they've got a low resonant shelf which actually adds a kind of resonant peak in there um which you know is kind of handy you can do that by stacking up multiple filters but it's kind of nice to have have that uh as an option uh and you see here you only get the low shelf and high pass and then up on the uh the upper bands you get the high shelf and the low pass but if we uh, put on the uh, high pass filter you can see the Q actually does affect how steeply that that cuts off and similar to that the high pass if we change the gain you can see the uh, the Q does affect that and you can also see that it's not just a smooth curve here. Uh, the Ren EQ kind of kind of emulates what some analog uh, EQs do. Uh, they're not you know these surgical digital EQs. They there there are kind of artifacts you know resonances that get created. Um, like if we drop that down here you can see you've got the low shelf here you're pulling this down 6 dB but there's a little bit of a of a of a bump there uh, and that, that can be a real musical musically useful thing to have uh, you know the bell filters are are pretty similar uh, one thing that's interesting about the Q, the Renaissance EQ is that when the the Q is kind of dynamic so you can see we've got a pretty wide boost here at the top here, you know, with a 
a wide boost with the bell curve. If you take that same Q, which at this point it's 1.17, uh, you make that a cut and it actually tightens up. And that's that's another thing that, you know, typically, you know, in a musical context, that's a more useful um, thing. You typically, you know, a wide uh, boost for a bell curve allows you to, to to change the EQ of something and not and it, it's a little less apparent. It sounds less EQ'd with a real tight boost. You know, you can hear really the effect of that. And kind of the converse is true when you're cutting. Um, you know, wide cut. You, you typically you're, you're not wanting to do wide cuts like that with a bell filter. So a little narrower narrowing down of it. You know, is uh, is useful. So, uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, let me show you a nice uh, technique, EQ technique. Let me um, solo the acoustic guitar. So this is acoustic guitar in that section where the loops are going on. Now, sometimes you've got a track where there's something you want to cut, but it's kind of hard to find it. Um, a great way to do that is by just boosting it until it's killing you, and then you can find that and pull it down. So let me show you what it sounds like sweeping around a, um, a filter on this uh, acoustic guitar. Suppose you wanted to to get kind of the, the thumpy low end, um, you know, dialing that in until it's really thumpy. Allows you to find the frequency and then you can pull it down and uh, and get rid of it. It's a little harder to, to find that when you're just doing the sweeping the, the, the cut around. So you can see that's it's a lot less obvious what's getting cut. So there you can just hear the fingers hitting the strings there. So so that was a, a tip I picked up years ago that I still use all the time. Um, you know, it's with uh, you know using workstations like this it's it's easy to to get into the habit of mixing with your eyes uh especially when you have you know tools like paths where you can see you know you might be able to go oh that, that's that frequency or you know mixing you know using the uh uh showing the uh you know all the uh waveforms but it's uh you know it's still audio it's um you know, you want to mix with your ears. Um, so using, uh, um, doing tricks like that where instead of just trying to look at a, a display or figure it out that way, you know, listen to it, figure out where it is, and deal with it. Um, the, uh, let me see. Uh, okay. Let's um, talk about polarity. Here's uh, uh, there's terms bandied about polarity and phase. Uh, some people call um, you know reversing phase by 100, 180 degrees versus polarity. Uh, technically, what you're seeing here is one signal, and then another one where the polarity is reversed. Um, I'll, I'll I'll talk about that a little bit uh, uh, more here in a sec. The uh, when working with live drums, you've got uh, often you'll mic the top of the snare and the bottom of the snare, and 
typically what happens is those are out, you know, different polarities. And like here, this is uh, zoomed in on the, the top snare track and the bottom snare track. You can see the waveforms are very different, but overall, you've got a number of sections, uh, you know, a lot of it that is out of phase. I mean, you see this big peak here is down below zero. This one's above zero. Um, so if you just take the, the top and bottom mic and let it go as is, you're going to have, um, it's going to sound kind of thin. So let me show you the uh, snare tracks here. I'll just solo, solo the snare tracks. It helps if there's drums going on. So this is uh, the two tracks together without any phase change. Uh, one of the thing, things that you uh, typically do is just flip the phase of the, the lower snare track. And here you, you'll be able to hear the actual, you know, the, the difference. It's, you'll hear it mostly in the low end. Um, so here's without any phase change. Said, here's without any phase change. And then with it, there's a little more meat to the snare. Uh, and a lot of EQs will, will have this. Like, you know, here it is in, in uh, the Q series. But on this snare track, I actually used the API. Uh, did a little bit of EQ on, on the bottom snare track. Uh, the API plugin, the, the UI is a little confusing. This is normal pol polarity, and when it's dark, you've got the reverse polarity. You can see it gets a little thin there. Um, so here's back to phase and polarity. You know what we're what we've just been doing is just reversing the polarity. It just takes whatever half was it was above zero, flips it to below. So it just you know makes a mirror image. And if you actually take two identical tracks. Invert invert the polarity of one of them, put them together, you'll get silence. Um, that normally doesn't happen in the real world, but um, you know what? Uh, talking about phase, uh, phase is often it's uh, based on delay. So when you talk about a waveform, it goes through 360 degrees. So this is 90 degrees, 180. 270 back to 360 or zero. Uh, so you can see a 90 degree phase shift is going to put it somewhat out of phase. 180 degrees, you know, if is will give you cancellation. It won't give you perfect cancellation, but it'll be uh, you know close to it. 270 is getting almost a wraparound again. Uh, and one thing about EQ is typically EQs. When you're EQing a, a section of audio or a, a, a band of audio, it's actually causing a little bit of delay in that. So you do get some phase shift. Um, sometimes that's a, um, a real musical, you know, it, it can be a pleasant thing. Uh, sometimes not so much, especially when you get a real narrow bandwidth. When you're really boosting or cutting a narrow bandwidth, that can cause some some harshness in in um, in what you're hearing. Sometimes good, um, sometimes bad. Uh, in a mastering context, we'll often use linear EQs. Uh, now, linear EQ uses a different uh, DSP model. Uh, 
to do the equalization, and it doesn't introduce phase shift, um, which is more in in mastering it. That's really important because you know if you want to just notch something or boost some narrow range, you don't want to cause phase shift. You you want to keep the whole uh, you know that that phase shift of that frequency range can cause a change in the stereo field. It can you know you know not not be a good thing. Uh, with the linear phase, you can really uh, uh, get in there and do uh, do surgical work and not really adversely affect the overall sound of the uh, the signal. So I'll, the uh, to be true to me, wading through this deepest blue reality. Uh, you can when I boost boost it way up, it just gets painful. But you can actually, you know, you can see it getting never... eight dB a boost in a pretty narrow range, and it's not causing the same kind of harshness that a that a normal EQ would use or create. Um, the linear phase stuff is I don't use it very often in mastering or in in mixing. Um, because you know sometimes that phase shift uh, is is does something cool for it. Um, the they've they got two versions: the linear phase, broadband, and then and the low band, which is for uh, really for just dealing with uh, stuff from 600 hertz and down. I don't think it goes any higher. No. Um, so you know the uh, the other side. Yeah, you know, the other downside of the linear phase is that they. Um, do use quite a bit more CPU. Um, doesn't seem to be too big of a deal these days with you know eight, twelve core machines. But uh, if you're using a laptop, you know you'll you'll definitely feel it. Uh, let me see. Okay, yeah, the fun stuff, the um, the model EQs. Um, these. Um, you know, Waves has got their, uh, you know, the VEQ, the, the Neve stuff, the Puig Tech, Pull Tech, uh, API, and Kramer. And, uh, you know, I, I really kind of gravitate toward those. There's, um, uh, that's the comp. The um, EQs, you know, it, uh, you know, you, you've got things like the Q10 and the Renaissance EQ that are just, um, you know, let you really pick any frequency, any cue, any, you know, you know totally flexible. Um, but these model EQs, you know, they're modeling these these uh, classic pieces. You know, you're limited on that. Like, um, you know, the, uh, the frequency selections are just fixed. They're not completely variable. Um, personally, I think the limitations actually foster creativity. You know, it makes you work with it to uh, to get what you want. Um, then also when you think about it, these classic uh, EQs were used on thousands of albums and you know those engineers didn't have any problems with, with those limitations. Um, and you know what uh, what I really like about these is is the modeling aspect. I mean they're they're modeling the, the shape of the EQ, you know what it what's doing the signal, but they're also often modeling the nonlinearities that are introduced with these analog um, equalizers, and that's where it it really gets fun. Um, now, for some of the waves uh, model EQs, they they do use um, you know, they they allow you to turn analog off and on. Um, for most of them. What I found is the analog really is just adding the noise, the self noise of the unit. Uh, I spent so many years trying to get rid of noise, I just can't bring myself to add it back in. Uh, the uh, so like with the VEQ, the uh, the nonlinearities, you know, the the distortion that that the EQ might produce is just part of the EQ, whether or not the analog button is on. Uh, the exception are the uh, API EQs. Uh, with that, the the nonlinearities are affected by the uh, you know you have to to get that 
when you turn analog on, you do get some of that cool distortion, you know, subtle distortion that the uh, that the original units produced. And with the API, the, you know, that gear was really quiet, so the noise that's introduced is really pretty min minimal. So, you know, my general rule is, you know, I use analog for all the API and everything else, all the other EQs, I, I leave it turned off. Um, so let me run through... Uh, just show a little bit of each each of these EQs. Um, like here's the uh, the inside kick mic. Now I'm doing not a whole lot of EQ on there, just boosting a little bit at, down at 35 hertz, so it gives a little little more thump in the bottom end. Uh, this is all kind of a Mixing it, uh, mixing these two, the inside and the outside mic. Here's here's the uh, outside mic. So it's really getting a, a combination of those two mics to work um, to work together to give you a good kick sound in the context of the entire kit. I mean, listening to it on its own doesn't sound like a doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it actually works in the mix. Um, So you can see with the outside kick mic, um, getting a little more extreme. I got a 9 dB at 50 hertz, 3 dB up at uh, 3 kilohertz. Um, so I'm accentuating really the, the low end thump and uh, the beater. Solo that and then, so you can hear this, here's uh, without it. And there's with it. Gives it uh, a lot more uh, punch. The uh, so let me uh, solo all the drums. So uh, see, so bypassing it there, you can hear how the kick really lost some of its uh, you know visceral impact. Uh, the API plugins, I just I love those on drums. They're uh, kind of first call for me for uh, for drums. And like here's uh, here I got the 550. This is the uh, the room mic. Um, it's actually stereo stereo mic'd in the room. So here it is, just uh, just dry. And then with the EQ in, you can hear it gets a little more, a uh, little punchier. You've got got a bunch of boost going on here. Now 30 hertz, 240, 3K, 7K. Um, and I'll let you hear that in and out um, on the entire kit. So here's without the, the room mic, and then I'll turn it on after I play it for a little bit. So it just gives you a little more of that, you know, you're there in the room kind of sound. A little more, uh, a little more impact. Uh, let me see. Uh, the, uh, the Puig Tex. Yeah, that's a good track. Now this is, uh, I love these, uh, um, the, 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 the Puig Tex really are kind of all about, you know, they, they do great stuff to the, to the, uh, mid range of the, uh, of the signal. They just, you know, I love the sound of that. It, it's a little bit weird. You look at all these knobs and it's not real intuitive. Um, actually in the book, I broke it out. Um, so you can see these are the controls that all work together. So these three are the low frequency, so you get your boost and attenuation. It's a little bit 
interesting because there's instead of just having a one boost cut knob i mean the original device you know the analog cir circuitry there were actually two different circuits one for boost and one for uh for cut you can actually boost and cut at the same time and it creates an interesting sound uh because it you know the bandwidth is not quite the same so you you do get some uh you know it, it can do some cool stuff uh, and you just have four different frequency selections here the uh the high frequency here you you have uh 3k 4k all the way up uh, and you have a and that's just boost only but you do have control over the bandwidth uh, so you can make it a you know wider or tighter and then you've got uh, just an overall attenuation of 5k 10k or 20k uh, and then the noise and in fact they went kind of took went the extra mile and they modeled the noise of uh of a US 60 hertz power system noise and then also the UK uh, 50k or 50 hertz um, so here is the guitar here's without the EQ You can see it's really getting more of the kind of the, the grind out of that um, you know it does a nice uh, does a nice thing to it the um, you see the Kramer is kind of a cool EQ I'm place in the song where I'm using that On this track, it's you know in in the book I start off using you know a Renaissance EQ and kind of changed changed things out. By the time we got to the end of the mix, um, I was using the the Kramer in there, and uh, it wasn't a radical difference, but it did make a make a difference. This one is really interesting. You've got uh, just a, a fixed 10k booster cut, which I'm not doing anything on this one. You've got a mid range. Uh, boost or cut depending on where this little toggle switch is and you have 700 hertz 1k 1 1.4 um, and then you have uh, the low, low frequency is pretty unique you've got either uh, 3 db 6 db 9 db roll off or you select a frequency and do a uh, you know a boost at that frequency so on this one i'm just i'm cutting out some of the low end giving a little bit of mid-range and uh, the low end wasn't too bad, but it just thinned it out a little bit, gave room for more of the other tracks. Uh, Reality. Okay, and the other uh, the other EQs, there's uh, uh, max bass, ren bass, and low air. Let me cover those real quick. Um, this bass track was me playing bass poorly. I'm actually more of a keyboard player, but uh, I like to pretend I'm a bass player from time to time. Um, I'll bypass that so you can hear the bass track itself. I've actually already got a uh, compressor and uh, me EQ going on here, but... Uh, yeah. Not the most sterile, stellar bass tone uh, you've probably ever heard. Uh, but it actually, by the time I got it treated up and mixed with the rest of the track, it uh, it actually does, a, you know, serves the purpose. Sounds a lot better in context than it does on its own. Uh, Max Bass is a really interesting plug-in. Um, its main use is to take the, the low frequencies and shift them up to the upper frequencies. Um, so the main idea is that you can make have the bass come across well on a uh, on a small speaker system. It can be useful on an individual track. If you've got something that's all sub frequencies you can use that to, to boost some of the uppers. Um, give it a little more presence in the low mid-range. 
Uh, the Renaissance base is a similar uh, uh, similar plugin. You use a similar technology, but you know different interface and a little little less control. You just have an intensity and a frequency. Uh, not something I'd choose for this track, but um, still can can be interesting. Uh, then the other one, the low air plugin, is uh, more for film and TV work where you want to generate stuff for the subs, uh, but it can have application in uh, in musical productions uh, when you really want to get some low frequency stuff. You got to be careful because you know it, it can cave in small speakers pretty easily. Um, you know, you can see in Paz here, it's just killing it down here, down, you know, 60 hertz and lower. Um, yeah, so if you use that, yeah, you want to be real careful. Um, so that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover here. Um, now, uh, I think we're at the point where, uh, We'll have uh, take some questions and see if I can answer them. Um, actually, we're already going a pretty good amount of time here, so uh, just use the uh, the text chat and uh, they'll see what uh, see what you guys are interested in finding out. As soon as one of these comes through here. Okay, I guess questions are going to be coming through here any moment now. Okay, uh, I got something from Dream State Recording. Uh, in the days of vinyl, mixes couldn't have out-of-phase content because they, they couldn't be cut into a groove. What are some techniques to eliminate out-of-phase content in mixes? Um, yeah, with vinyl, it's uh, the out-of-phase stuff. It was more for the low frequencies and the high frequencies. The high frequencies, you know, the needle could deal with it. If you had stuff out of phase, or even low frequencies panned hard one side or the other, uh, you can cause the, the stylus to just to jump right out of it. Um, for that, you know, that's uh, the uh, Waves has a different tool. It's not EQ. Um, I can't remember the name. It's when you get all of them, it's kind of hard to find. But there's a um, they've got a, uh, a a tool that allows you to pan you know, or, or deal with um, the uh, shoot, what's it called? Oh, center. That makes sense. Uh, with center, you can control how much of you know how the the hard pan stuff, the uh, you know bring that into the center. Um, you know, with uh, when you have stuff out of phase, if it's a stereo track. Uh, that's kind of a problem. If you're dealing with multiple tracks, you can potentially find one thing, you know, the, the one track that's causing the phase issues and maybe just roll off the low end. Uh, that that uh, can sometimes fix it. But yeah, phase issues can really be uh, be tricky. Much easier to deal with in, uh, in mixing than in mastering, though. Uh, okay, uh, Wes is asking uh, the best all-around waves plug-in for EQ if you're on a budget. Um, you know the the uh, waves um, Renaissance EQ is incredibly flexible and very musical, um, and you can even get that in the uh, the Musicians Two bundle, which is really inexpensive. And but also now Waves is doing a lot of uh, uh, a la carte plugins. Uh, I love Renaissance EQ. You know, I could 
be happy doing mixes with just Ren EQ. Uh, I like that a little bit better than, than the Q10, just because, you know, partly because you do have bandwidth control and slope on the, uh, the shelving and the high-pass, low-pass filters. Um, I think overall my the plugins I have the most fun with are the API, but those are definitely not uh, in the budget category. Uh, but definitely a Ren, Ren EQ. Okay, uh, Sterling is asking, any suggestions for your master bus with EQ, if anything at all? Uh, that's a good one. Um, I do a lot of mastering work, and one of the things that I encourage clients, discourage clients to do, is putting too much stuff on the master bus, uh, especially Dynamics plugins. Uh, you can get a mix in a state where you just there's nothing you can do in mastering. Um uh, there are some some things that do that that you know create a, a nice effect and are useful on there. Um, whatever you put on the master bus, just try not to go overboard. Uh, the The modeling EQ plugins are good, um, I like the API stuff. Um, it's uh, it's just kind of a tone thing and. Sometimes it's nice because it'll it will change the the tone of the mix and you mix to that tone. Um, you know, sometimes a little bit of bus compression is good too. The uh, the API twenty five hundred sounds great, but you only want to go you know a couple of dB. You don't want to go crazy because uh, you'll drive the mastering guy mad, or, or and you also be end end up with a mix that you really can't do much with later. Um, Let's see, and we've got a question from Ashley Smith. Uh, can you please talk a little bit about finding pockets for instruments using EQ and creating space across the frequency spectrum for each to sit? Uh, yeah, there, there's two main tools to use to, to make the mix all work together. Uh, there's EQ, well, you know, three, tick, there, EQ, volume, and panning. Uh, in this mix, I'm not going too crazy with panning. Um, I've got, you know, there's a couple of main guitar tracks. Um, so there's uh, chords, and then there's pick guitar track. I got those kind of panned off a little bit because they're in a similar frequency frequency range. Um, and uh, I'm also doing a, a little bit of a EQ with the uh, on one of them to um, you know, make the guitar like that was the uh, the Puig Tech that I was showing you. Uh, it took that pick guitar track and made it kind of stand out a little bit more. Uh, the other track, I'm doing a little bit of a of a dip around 700. So the 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 more open ringing chords, I'm thinning that out in the uh, in the low mids to make room for the other one. And it's uh you know it's a big puzzle. You know you want to um, you know I typically start off. You know, the first thing I do in a mix is just listen down and just do panning and faders and try to get get it working. And then going, you know, then the next step is doing inserts, you know, putting in EQs to, to make things fit to, uh, you know, to, to get, uh, you know, there might be some, you know, low end build up that you need to thin some things out. Um, and then, you know, the very last thing I get into is automation. Uh, and that's just all the fine tuning. Uh, let's see, Donato is asking: Are there any ways besides using a deesser to counteract sibilance introduced by mid-high boosts on a vocal? Um, not really. That's uh, you know, a lot of times you do want to bring a vocal out and make it uh, nice and bright and open sounding. And I think on on this one, I'm using. The, on the verse, I've got a, a Ren channel going, so I've got some EQ, some compression, and actually I think I'm using the compression, I've got a sidechain going, and using that to, uh, to de-S it. Um, you know, de-Sers, you just got to be careful, you want to make sure that you're just pulling out the S's and not making it, you know, giving the, uh, the singer a lisp. It's pretty easy to to do that. So that, that's a good balancing act. Um, um, so getting good with the Essers is, uh, is a very useful skill. 
Uh, Kevin is asking, if you're using one EQ to fix a bad frequency and another mainly for its tone shaping, which would you put first in the chain? Uh, typically, I'll pull out the, uh, I'll do the corrective stuff first. You know, get rid of that and then work on the rest. Um, and that also applies when you're using compression. Uh, you want typically you want to do EQ before compression, um, especially if you're doing some big cuts, because uh, you don't want to feed something with a whole bunch of low end into a um, into a compressor, and then cut it after the fact. Um, typically, it's better to do it the other way. Uh, Chris is asking when EQing vocals. I was told subtractive equalization was the way to go. What are your thoughts on this? Um, yes and no. There's, um, uh, you know, definitely you want to, you, a lot of engineers tend to just do nothing but boost. And that's a problem. You end up with just buildups and it's, you know, it's hard to, to make things cut through. Uh, uh, I don't know that I've ever done a mix where I've only done cut on vocal EQ. Um, you know, Often, you know, just boosting the high frequency to get a little air in the vocal is good. Um, you know, boost too much, and then you get into the situation where you need to use a de -esser. Um So really don't be afraid of, uh, of low-cut EQs, you know, cutting EQs, and especially, you know, cutting out the low-end stuff that you're not even hearing in the mix. Um, yeah, that can go a long way to make, it, make things intelligible. Um, like the EQ on the chorus vocal, I'm not really doing much of anything. Just uh, just cutting out the the low rumble, and the uh, the verse vocal, cutting out the low end, giving a little bit of bump up in the top, and then uh, de-essing to to compensate for that. Um, do I ever use multi-band compression instead of EQ? Uh. Sometimes. And in fact, in the book, as I went through, um, I think it was on the bass track, that was kind of a problem. Uh, at one point I was, try I was using C4 to try to get it under control, because I mean, C4 is, uh, is a really powerful tool. And so I, I was trying to, trying to beat it into shape at one point, but uh, it, multiband compression, you know, since you can adjust individual bands, uh, it can act as an overall EQ, as even without it acting uh, on the dynamics. Uh, I use that sometimes in mastering. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to use that. It, it really you have to be very careful because a little bit of that in in a ma on a master fader is going to completely change the balance of things. Um, so that, that's kind of hard. sometimes I use the linear multiband compressor but just fairly mildly. Uh, let's see, Matt is asking, how, how do you like to incorporate compression with EQ to create the boosted punchy pump sound? Um, yeah, for that, well, actually, the, uh, the lead, the chorus vocal with uh, the CLA just slamming it. In fact, I'll, that one is... Uh, Running a crowd. Let me unsolo the guitar. Um, and my sails all in tatters, looking around. You can see that's like getting stupid, like 10, 20 dB worth of compression. Um, so in this case, I I have the compression going, and then I'm following that with uh, with some EQ just to get rid of the low end. But, um, you know, for that over-compressed kind of pumping sound, um, you know, it's whatever works. Sometimes you, you need to really juice it up before you hit the compressor, and then sometimes you have to do a little more after. Sometimes you have to use a couple of compressors to get, to get that sound. Uh, and it's not, you know, there's nothing subtle about it. Um, and it really depends on the vocal and the concept, context of the tune. Um, Let's see, somebody's asking, do you use EQ before compression or vice versa? It kind of depends. Um, the uh, using compression before 
it, it depends on the type of compression and the type of EQ. Uh, if you're doing kind of large shaping, I generally will do that before a compressor, you know, cut off a lot of the low end. Because if you leave the low end, if you do, if you're cutting off a lot of low end, you hit the compressor first, that low end is going to make the compressor just go nuts. And then you cut it off. So then all you're left with is kind of some of the artifacts of the, of the compressor acting. So in that case, I always put the, the EQ first. Um, often I'll put EQ after compression because, uh, you know, you get the compression doing what you want and then EQ to kind of shape it and, uh, and push it from there. Or I may not want, you know, if I want to make it brighter, I may not want the uh, the compressor to act more actively on the brighter sections. I, I want to brighten it after the compression is done, uh, which can make it a little more dynamic after the fact. But you know, it's a, an aesthetic judgment call in that in that case. Uh, let's see, Jeff is asking, uh, with such a wide variety of EQs to choose from, it's not always clear to me which one to pick for a particular situation, as many of them look like they are doing roughly the same thing with just different approaches. Uh, do you have any rule of thumb, or you just learn from experience how nuances of each specific EQ plugin colors the tone and the sound? Uh, pretty much the latter. Um, you know, you just kind of start to get a feel for things, and, you know, historically... You know, when you, you read about, you know, like the, the Poltex, you know, they're kind of famous for uh, being used on electric guitars. And, you know, you start using an electric guitar and, and you can hear it just immediately. It's like, okay, yeah, this is just, it, it does great things on there. Um, the APIs are really useful across the board. Um, I really personally like those on drums because of, you know, the, the nonlinearities, the distortions that you create sound great on drums um you know it's uh so there's uh not too much you know just wrote use this on this use that on that it's uh kind of getting a feel for it and uh it's one of the other things i like about the uh the model dqs is they have character and you kind of figure out that you know the character of what they're doing and it's uh you know it, it just uh you want to get these so you're not overthinking it and you're just using it as tools. Uh, so really just play around until you, uh, you know, like what you're getting. Uh, let me see. Uh, Sterling is asking, can you comment on using the built-in EQ in a DAW as opposed to EQs uh, plugins used in an insert? Uh, Yeah, well, that kind of ties in with Jeff's question about, uh, you know, picking EQ. Um, I'm using Digital Performer myself, and they've got actually uh, this initial insert that does have its own, uh, you know, you can put in EQ and compression in there. And, you know, DP's got its own, uh, you know, Masterworks EQ, and they've got their normal, you know, it's, it's kind of like Renaissance EQ versus uh, Q10. Um I actually don't use that a whole lot, um, partly because I tend to gravitate toward the model EQs. Uh, but I I wouldn't uh, really hesitate to, uh, you know, especially if you're doing something where you just, okay, let me cut off some of the rumble here, you know, do a little bit of cor corrective thing up front. Uh, you know, those work just fine. Uh, but I tend to, you know, kind of mix and match the, uh, the uh, insert order. You know, sometimes I'll try EQ and then compression, not like what's going on, flip them around, re readjust. Um, so the, the built-in EQs, um, if you're talking about those that insert prior to everything, you know, that's a consideration. Uh, as far as using the built-in EQs um, in general, yeah, just a aesthetic judgment call. You know, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever sounds good. Um, Isis is asking, uh, I'd like to know more about Ren Channel. A red channel, you know, it's just it's a personal thing. I I tend not to really gravitate too much toward the the channel plugins, uh, but they are really useful. Uh, red channel packs a lot in there. You've got uh, you know EQ, and you've got uh, compression. And you've got different flavors of compression. 
it'll uh, do the the Renaissance Vox compressor or the Renaissance Renaissance uh, compressor, which have different. Uh, it kind of work works slightly differently. Um, you have control over putting the EQ before the compressor, EQ after the compressor. Um, you've also got a gate, overall output gain, polarity invert. Uh, they're they're uh, really uh, you get a lot of bang in for for your buck in there. But when you have a lot of plugins, you know, and you know you like the the vintage stuff, you know, I, I tend to like to uh, you know just mix and match other ones. You know, and use plugins from you know other companies too. I mean, you've got different uh, different tones, different tools. Uh, see, Charlie's asking any tips for EQing cymbals, hi hat, ride, overhead. Um, yeah, quick one on, on the uh, hi hat is like in this mix, and pretty much every mix I do, you get a mic on the hi hat. And uh, let me unsolo the other one. Um, there's generally enough hi hat coming through everything else that you really don't need much on the hi hat mic itself. So I almost always just hack off most of the low end. And if it's a particularly sibilant hi-hat, I'll take off some of the high end and then use a hi-hat track itself just to dial in the amount of presence that I want the hi-hat to have in the mix. Because even listening to all the drums without the hi-hat at all, you know, it's, it's pretty much there. Um, you want to be careful boosting frequencies on overheads. Uh, it can get uh, real, real harsh real quick, and it's also kind of hard to um, to cut frequencies effectively without making it sound dull. Uh, sometimes I'll use a deesser uh, on an overhead or a cymbal track uh, if they're real spiky. Uh, a deesser can can do wonders. Uh, the Waves Trans X plugin, you know, if you've got real sharp attacks, that that can be nice. Uh, see, Brian is asking, I like my mix to have a very analog warm feel. I grew up in the late 70s, early 80s. What plugins do you re recommend on the Master Bus for this feel? Um, you know, that's uh, as, you know, when I mix, I tend to leave the Master Bus alone. Sometimes I'll use something, but uh, even if I'm doing something where I'm, gonna, I'm doing the mix and I'm also going to be doing the mastering, I really treat it as two separate processes. You know, I do the mix, I get a good mix, and then I do a completely separate mastering pass. You know, typically pulling multiple songs together to to master as a set. It's um, uh, it's a uh, a good thing. You know, j just to I mean, just for one thing, to have an, a good archive mix, an unmastered unadulterated mix so years down the road you know you can actually remaster it and you're not just stuck with whatever you happen to throw on the master bus as far as the warmth goes a lot of that comes into just individual tracks how it's mixed what eqs you use i mean the the uh, you know the the model eqs makes you uh, you know at least think it's warmer uh but they actually are i mean a lot of it you know you can really get a lot of the same sound and it's uh more Figuring out, uh, you know, how to piece the mix together and going from a warmer sound is going to, um, you know, entail different EQ choices and different balance choices. Uh, and it's, uh, I don't know, that, that's, uh, uh, that's an experience thing. You just uh, need to do it. You know, c actually comparing with uh, your mix to the other mixes and trying to figure out what you're doing. Uh, one thing that you want to do all the time is listen to commercial releases on your studio system and just get dialed into how it sounds. Um, okay, so we're going to take the, the last question here. Uh, is from Johannes Lehmann. Uh, have you had a chance to use the new Hybrid EQ plugin yet? And if so, where would you say it fits with the other keys you mentioned? Um, yeah, I wrote the book before... Uh, 
the uh, hybrid EQ is released. Uh, I did, uh, I do beta testing for Wave, so I, I have been playing with it for for a while now, and it's uh, it's a very cool EQ, and it it really, um, you know, I I would say, uh, getting familiar with the other model EQs is probably a good thing to do before getting into hybrid EQ because uh, it does use some of the you know some of the tonality from from these other model plugins or these other uh, EQs it's really powerful um, it's also something you can kind of fall down the rabbit hole and trying well, let's try this band with this and this band with that um, it's uh, you know really uh, really nice I mean it's something that uh, I'll probably uh, end up using more often uh, just because it is so flexible you don't you know if if you don't like what's going on you can switch out the character in bands and and get a different feel for it um, so that's a it, it's a it's a very cool EQ um, and kind of kind of across the board um, well I think we're uh, we're pretty much done here uh, thanks for uh, tuning in the uh, so the uh, uh, my website if you want to check it out it's otherroom.com um, the uh, all the, the the track that I was playing here uh, all the all the individual tracks for that are downloadable uh, information you can find at wavesbook.otherroom.com uh, you can download the tracks you can download all the waves presets uh, and there's links uh, to places where you can uh, buy the book Amazon and so on um, and I, I think we're about here. Uh, thanks again. I hope I uh, was able to pass on something useful. All right, that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you, Barry, and thank you all for taking part. We hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in more information about the interactive book, Waves Plugins Workshop, Mixing by the Bundle, please visit sound.org. Okay, that is it. Thanks again, Barry, and thank you all for attending. Have a great day, and we hope to see you at the next one.